His Holiness, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start, <coughs> I would like to express our appreciation to His Holiness, especially on behalf of the delegation of quantum scientists came from Taiwan and the United States. Uh, this morning, my discussion will be on the challenges and opportunities for a sustainable planet. The picture you see, you're seeing, it's not Dalandasa. It looks That's quite similar. <laughs> oh, okay. That was the place I left 23 years ago. In, this is my home in California. I left oh, 23, California. Yes, 23 years ago in. Uh, not Taiwan. No. <laughs> Well, <laughs> but now I want to show you where Taiwan is located. Taiwan is located in one of the uh. of these earths. Well, yesterday we did discuss the quantization, and if you if we have any object like sun or uh, Earth, the sun is burning bright, maybe five thousand degrees centigrade, and when a body is so hot, it will radiate photons. And the distribution of photons will follow. follow <laughs> so when temperature is high, like sun, it runs 5,000 degrees centigrade, the most brightest part is the visible light that we can see. But if you look at the Earth, average temperature is around 20 degrees. It's only emit infrared photons. Wavelength is long. We cannot see with a naked eye. We can see it with an instrument, but we know it's naked eye. Yesterday, we did say in order to explain the distribution of energy of photons in a photon, <laughs> photon okay. energy. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Max Planck has to come up with the idea that the energy coming out and going in has to be quantized. And that was the started to understand the quantum mechanics, so called quantization of photons in the energy exchange. Well, this Earth system, solar system, was established something like 4.5 billion years ago. And sun was keep on burning. And on the surface of the Earth, many things happened. And I want to go very quickly. I, I cannot go year by year. Then it will take 4.5 billion years. So. I'll go through very quickly. Well, that was about 30 years ago. A satellite looked at the picture of the Earth. That's what it looked like. Before the Second World War, a philosopher did say, if one day humanity can go far away and take the picture of the entire Earth, then Earth should change. People know that there's only one Earth. We have to live together, and national boundary might be just a line on the map. Nature would not recognize those national boundaries, and entire globe will be united. And that was the thinking of philosopher. But that not that haven't happened yet. But over the years, there is. Earth system changed. And about two million years ago, humanity appeared and evolved. And it was around 10,000 years ago, agriculture started in many parts of the world. Around that time, almost the entire part of the Earth are populated by humanity, except New Zealand. The, the settlement was not started until 1,200 years ago. 
But when agriculture started, there are native, um, you know, the peoples in New Zealand. Then Australia, native people. No, so for they, example, they are those those native people in Australia when they are yeah. almost fifty thousand years ago, huh? they are from Africa. But New Zealand is around twelve hundred years ago, hopping through island and mm. went down there. But around ten thousand years ago. So do you have some idea? Uh, some Native American, yes. they say, originally they come from Central Asia and through Alaska, yeah. and then they reach yes. uh, North, North America. America. That's right. Yes. Do you have something to say? Is that, well, is that true? Many uh, people uh, learning human migration, they have some evidence that might have three routes going through. And for example, people live in this part of the world. Migration is coming from the south of Himalaya. But um, another branch is from the north of Himalaya, the mix in the eastern part of Asia. So 10,000 years ago, one thing happened in, on the surface of Earth, that is the agriculture. And that yes. was the first time human activity impacted the global environment, but the impact was not that big. And at that time, men are still hunter, food gatherer. Their income are not dependent. The income of women are more dependent. So the position of the society, women, is higher. The other boss, men are really no very dependable at the time. And, and some people some people say the human being mm -hmm. first in Africa. Yes. Then you see one branch to east. Right. One north and then European. Yes. East uh, I think India, China, like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, how many years? Do you the, know something? The migration. Migration actually started Africa. So the human uh, evolution of humans on uh, African continent. Yeah. Do we have any estimate when it? That's right. That was about fifty to hundred thousand years ago. People went out. Actually, earlier, uh, the former lectures was the ones who migrated out. And the Neanderthal is the second way move out. According to archaeological finding, Lord the modern human language, migration so do we know what part of Africa where the, actually the human population you know started something? to migrate? Southern part of Africa. Southern part of Africa. Southern part of Africa. So was it connected with the river Niles flow in that kind of area? Uh, no, a little more further south. And then the third wave of migration came out those are our ancestors called Homo sapiens. And no matter you are black, Caucasian, or Asian, all of us are so-called Homo sapiens. Those people migrated out around 50,000 years ago from Africa. Well, the Industrial Revolution, uh, no, the starting of the farming, allow people to build the bigger structures so they don't have to move anymore. So from that time, you do see some big structures and women who are higher in the society working hard in the field. But the next big change is really the Industrial re Revolution. That revolution really changed the humanity and also changed the uh, living environment. 
the reason was in the agricultural society, all people eat and energy use are still directly came from sunshine. But after the industrial revolution, we invented the machine, locomotives, internal combustion engine, and then started to dig all the fossil fuel underground and transform many things. For example, if you look at this picture, you see on the left hand side, we have some Aboriginal tribe living in the plain of Taiwan. Uh, that is supposed to be the wedding ceremony. Uh, bride and bridegroom was carried by people. But in that picture, the house closing, what they are eating, all came directly from the sun. But after the Industrial Revolution, people started to dig underground and use the coal to transform material into steel, aluminum, make cement, and gradually we dissociate from the nature. And Africa, Michan, Rutunga, migration goes to Jay. Now, just under Gemi, at the burn all yours, six sessions in his jaggy. Ha. Ha. Something I don't. She's not very. Michan. So, um, you know, based on archaeological uh, study that was done by a group of scientists from Shanghai mm -hmm. in Tibet, they mm -hmm. found um, evidence for human habitation dating back to 35,000 oh. years. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's about, about right. Yeah. I think massive migration started 50,000 50, in around Tibet, northern route. Uh, about 35,000 is already spread out. They thought that they could stop. Africa, you mean Tangusha to the Nello, Nutchi. Marie, Tango migration, Jebeka, the Michatu gets married, was a penetra, goes over. Deep migration. But do it, so migration is dated around 50,000 from African continent. Right. But how about uh, the actual emergence of modern human being on about Africa? About two million years ago. Two million years two ago. Million. Yeah. Hmm? So called African young, it's a Nell Pearl, little Nell Janal little. So, do we know the, when the migrations came from Africa, did they come to reach Tibet first or China? <laughs> I think they came out from one, you see, Kasoda, Mongol, right. and Tibet naturally right. firstly reached this area. Then, I think Tibet itself, you see, there is indication yes. the ancient Tibetan, Tibetan sort of civilization, civilization yeah. Western part. Began in the western part of Tibet. Yeah. 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 Then, uh, in, uh, so the Tibetan Tibet. civilization actually first began more in the western part of Tibet, That's right. and then sort of moved further down yeah. the central, and then the eastern and northeastern. That's right. For, for example, my ancestor from DNA typing, we knew that we came from the western part of China, mm. and before many many thousand years ago, mm. it's a further West, mm. and then the migration route, a branch go from northern part of Himalaya, like come to Tibet. Mm. This branch came from southern part of Himalaya, and mm. the, those people have to Papua New Guinea, and they mixed again. Himalaya, Indus Valley. The civilization the Indus Valley. So in Indian, for example, one of the ancient Indian civilization is the Indus Valley civilization. So there might have been another migration route coming that way. That's right. India, some of them came from the northern route and come south. And mm -hmm. some of them come from the southern route. I, I'm a quantum chemist, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, I, what I told you is ab ab about right. <laughs> 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 but after the Industrial Revolution, you see what happened? It's really 
amazing to see that the, it's the rise of fossil fuel. 1850, we all burned wood. And then after the steam engine invented, when time goes on, people start to burn more coal. There's the brake color and brown color is the oil, natural gas. And we start to use some hydropower and nuclear. But most of the energy we are consuming today are the fossil fuel. The amazing thing is, in such a short time, only about 260, 270 years, energy consumption went up. And energy, initially, we depend on the sun. But now, it depends on the energy accumulated by sunshine over billions of years on the underground. And this is really uh, horrible things. And when I say horrible, you can see there are a couple of things happening. One is because of the improvement of the material good and living condition, development of medicine, population went up, went up very quickly. So when 20th century started on the surface of the earth, there were 1.5 billion people. The end of the century is already up to 6 billion. Now it's reaching 7.3 billion. And we do expect population will keep on going up to about 9.7 billion in the middle of the century, 9.7 billion. So you can see on the surface of the Earth, initially it looks like an infinity. Such a large earth, but with the population exp explosion and with the consumption increase, we're changing all the environment, changing greatly. So, this is another view of the sun and earth. Because humanity is living in a very thin layer on the surface of the earth, no more than 50 kilometers. So yesterday talking about water and air, ozone and all those. Because of the population explosion and in increase of the consumption, just during the last century, per capita consumption increased by a factor of four, no, by a factor of two, population went up by a factor of four. So Earth was carrying eight times more load than from the beginning to the end of this century. And that started to do some very, very bad things. One thing everybody is aware of is the pollution. On the top left hand side of the picture is Taiwan, in the city of Taipei. And on the bottom right is in Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur is the two twin towers there. But no matter where you go, you go to the cities because of the traffic or industry of burning some very primitive fuel, air is polluted. And every year, millions and millions of people die from air pollution. And so this is one thing we are doing. But of course, air pollution it's quite serious in the urban area, but if you come to like Dalman Lhasa, it's not as bad. It's diluted out in locally are not producing uh, too much pollution itself. When when wind blows, blow away most of it. But the one of the more serious thing is the balance of energy. As we keep on burning, we produce carbon dioxide carbon dioxide, and we call it the greenhouse gases. Why? Because as I said, Earth is cool, 20 degrees centigrade. They emit the photon with the long wavelengths, we call infrared photon. Energy is lower. But those photons will be absorbed by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrogen, nitrogen oxide. Those will absorb the photons. 
The photon coming in, sun irradiating the Earth because sun is hot. They come with a visible photon, like we look outside, so beautiful. That is because sun gives us the visible photon that we can see. Visible photon will not be absorbed by the greenhouse gases. So what happening at the present time is as the greenhouse gases increases, more energy coming in. Actually, I should not say more energy coming in. Energy coming in is for millions of years, maybe quite similar. But the energy going out was trapped, trapped by greenhouse gases. So if we, if we sit there and think about the energy balance, the more energy coming in, then more energy going out. So like human beings, we eat, eat more than we can consume, then we're going to gain weight. And tem temperature of the Earth is rising. It's rising. And if you ask me how much energy we are receiving and how much energy we are uh, sending out of the universe and what is the gap between this energy, the difference between the energy coming in and going out is equivalent to 350,000 nuclear bomb of the size of which drop in Okinawa, uh, in Okinawa, in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, is every day. So every day we sit here, 350,000 nuclear bomb is bombing the Earth, except Earth is still big. So those energies are distributed, except the surface of the Earth gaining more energy and become warmer and warmer. And when the Earth becomes warmer, water vapor evaporates. There's more water in the atmosphere. And as we all know, typhoon, all those energy, is really came from the water vapor in the air. As the water vapor getting more, typhoon becomes bigger and bigger. And sometimes in the continental area, as the temperature goes up, water evaporated, you have a drought. So the consequences of global warming is the extreme weather, extreme weather event. So this year, it's 19, 2018, we broke all the record. Temperatures highest over the years and lots of damage taking place all over the world. And we are in a very dangerous situation and that was what I'm concerning about. Because if we keep on going the way it has been, it will not take too many years. We'll be in a very, very situation and it's very difficult to live in on this earth. So, I said temperature is going up. So look at the trend. The way things are going, the, the, the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we are dumping, the temperature, if we do not do anything, temperature will rise to around four or five degrees above pre-industrial revolution period. That was by the end of the century. That would not be possible for humanity to survive under that condition. So people said we have to bend the curve and try to limit the temperature rise to two degrees centigrade. That was why two degrees centigrade came about. More than 15 years ago, people said two degrees centigrade, two degrees centigrade, because if temperature were to go up more than two degrees centigrade, disaster could happen. Actually, the current situation is not ideal. Uh, either. And, well, scientists have been saying that. And do you believe in scientists? Of course, how much energy going in, how much energy going, uh, going out, those are scientists can do all the calculations. But estimate of what will happen when temperature rises still needs some investigation. This figure, 
uh, it's called Bernie Number. It's constructed by Johan Dukström, uh, a very good friend of mine. It shows that the, uh, you know, don't look at the detail yet. We just look at the three, three bands. One is 2001 and 2007 and 2013. In, in the 201 report, they said, with temperature goes up, extreme weather event and sudden change all could take place. But if you look at the fifth column, risk of uh, large impact. This is still at the fight color, even temperature go up to three degrees. So what's the indication of the arrow pointing downwards? What's the significance of that? It comes downward means that after scientists study more and more and more and more, then the possibility of the Earth go to a sudden change. It's really not at 4 degree, 2.4 degree, 2.5 degree, that could happen already. So this three band shows the scientific investigation shows the situation is really much worse than what we are thinking. So, so, so let, let me go into a more detail and look at the most recent investigation, actually during the last couple of weeks. IPCC already put up another report to show that the situation is really serious. So let, let's just look at this picture. The color, white color, it means everything is okay. Then when you turn orange, things become bad and become red and purple. Things become very horrible. So if you look at the unique threatened system, so in some of the mountain in areas steep and waterfall were called landslide and those unique threatened system. It's already in the yellow color. It's already now, it's already pretty bad. And if you look at the far right, it's called large scale singular event. It means some big event happened and Earth will go into another state, irreversible and mankind might dis disappear. Well, if you look at the curve, it shows that the zero degree, it means uh, about seven years ago, it is still at five colors, so it looks okay. That was the reason why people said two degree, two degree, and then gradually shift to 1.5 degree, 1.5 degrees. But now, if you look at these two curves, from left hand side is the current temperature set as zero. From the right hand side, the scale is pre-industrial period was set at zero. And now, if you look at the the goal, we said two degrees, two degrees. Every column is already become the dark orange or into the red. It's not acceptable. Large scale singular events is already very probable. So two degrees is really not no good. So now people say, maybe 1.5 degree, but if we do not do anything, temperature will reach 4.5 degrees. Now, we are at 1.15 degrees. Before Industrial Revolution, and now, temperature already is rising by 1.15 degrees. And if we said, we said that the 1.5 degrees, there's no much, no much time left anymore. If you keep on doing the same thing without changing drastically within 10 years, we'll reach there. So we already said we don't have much time left. We don't have much time left. Sun will be burning for billions of years. Humanity might be started to suffer. And if there's a big, large scale, singular event takes place, humanity just might go. And this is really very dangerous. 
have a granddaughter. I have only one granddaughter who's 12 years old. Maybe 11 or 12. My wife always said, you should know the age of your child, but it, they keep on changing every year. <laughs> <laughs> so she's about 11 or 12. She always tell her friend and said, I don't worry about global warming. Why? Because my grandfather works very hard on this. <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> So you tell her friend and my grandfather is very capable, so I don't worry about global warming. <laughs> I said that's not true. I have to ask everybody to work together, especially your holiness. You, you can help. So, as I, as I said, we don't have much time left. And people didn't really understand we have been bombarded by lots of energy. We could run to 350,000 nuclear bombs every day. So this year we really broke the record. And extreme weather event is something we do, did not experience. This was 10 years ago in Taiwan. It's called uh, Typhoon Morocco. This Taiwan is already removed from the future name of Typhoon. Um, same place? Russia. Same place. Russia. That was August 8th of two o August 7th or August 8th or 2008. At that time, International Council for Science. Some of the people came to Taiwan and tried to understand how are we prepare for the extreme weather events. And when they came, they stayed. Typhoon came, Typhoon stayed. And in one day, this place dropped 1.7 meters of rain. 1.7 meters of rain, actually about my height. 1.7 meter rain dropped in one day. So entire village is wiped away and 700 people killed yes, just for one day. Uh, this is called extreme weather event. So water is not always wonderful, Dr. Fong. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have too much water to uh, suffer. Well, the following year, Taiwan getting bigger. The Taiwan hit uh, Philippines. The Taiwan called Haiyan. But Filipino people say, Yolanda Typhoon. That wind speed at the time broke the record. The wind uh, touched the earth, break the record, and brought lots of damages. So, afterward, by two, 2015, Many politicians started to be awakened. Scientists said, it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad. We have to control the temperature. We have to reduce the emission in the year of 2015. In September, United Nations passed the Sustainable Development Goal. And in December, this is in Paris. Paris, after this terrorist attack in Paris was quite chaotic for a while, but they are quite amazing. They hold this meeting of oh, IPCC, and that was the first time politicians all over the world came together and conclude that we should reduce the carbon emission, mm -hmm. and they came up with some solutions. It's a non-binding non global agreement to move toward the two degrees centigrade limit because if we do not do anything to go up to four degrees, so the meeting said two degree limit and ideally to a 1.5 degree centigrade limit because two degrees is really horrible. And the way scientists present the global warming by two degree or 1.5 degree, really 
do not touch the heart of the people very well. Actually, 1.5 degree, if you look at the energy and all the extreme weather events, it's horrible. They also agree that they about $100 billion a year to help developing country by 2020. It's two years from now. Time is coming. From developed country to developing country, transfer to 100 billion years, 100 billion a year. That's a small problem because global economic scale is 1,000 times more than that. But the third thing is to revisit carbon reduction plans in 2020. And that revisit, I am quite sure the so called non binding global agreement will be modified and something stronger control will take place in two years from now. Because this year really awakened lots of people. Let me show some of the seriousness of um, Taiwan. This picture shows the damage brought by Typhoon Harvey within the last year. Brought lots of damage. I think it's uh, it rain about three meters on three days, and wind and drop, uh, wind and rain drop, destroy Houston area quite drastically. And last summer, we did see forest fire burning. This is the forest fire in California. In California, every year in August, the start of a forest fire, but this year is in June, started in June, and Sweden started burning earlier. And the 23 places in Sweden was burning, then followed by California, Australia, many places are burning, and we also see the typhoon which hit Japan very recently, the past summer. Kansai Airport uh, was really very heavily damaged. I'm sorry to show that the, all the bad things done by water uh, today. <laughs> 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 but the people's minds are quite simple. They always say, oh, we are not lucky to this year. All those typhoons originally moved to Taiwan and then changed the direction and hit Japan. This summer, all typhoon hit Japan. I was giving a lecture in uh, Takamatsu, Japan, about a month ago, when I mentioned that they all look at me. I said, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do it. It's just global weather pattern changes and all hit Japan. But next year, all of those typhoons might hit Taiwan. But things are getting worse and worse. But as I said, People always feel that, they, well, that will happen only once in 100 years or one in, once in 50 years. We will not take it very seriously. But if you look at the Earth as its entirety all the time, then you see a different picture. Let me show you a picture taken by satellite, NASA satellite, on August 23rd. This is the August 23rd. This is not the real picture of the Earth. It's the color coded. The red means fire taking place. Mm -hmm. You saw the western coast of California, Washington area, forest fire, it was raging. In Asia, those smoke are really not the burning, but we burn those agricultural waste in the old gray field produces lo lots of common soot is showing red and many other places are really forest fire and the green color is storm in the ocean produce lots of uh, tiny little uh, particles uh, air source from ocean so what was the thing about ocean Typhoon yes. will produce also particle, aerosol particle in the air. Yeah. Oh. 
So the fourth part is the dust, wind was blowing, the dust. So th this is the, uh, the picture, I said the earth is burning, it's boiling, getting worse and worse. And nowadays, somebody go to Siberia, who find in the lake, used to be a tundra, frozen lake, melted, and gas are bubbling out, and those gas are methane, those are greenhouse gases. And one day, if a lot of methane, which uh, form as a methane hydrate, castrate, it means that they, in deep in the ocean, te when temperature is cool, pressure is high, many methane is surrounded by water and called methane castrate. And when the ocean warm up, that methane might be released. released. And some of the people said, well, we can use that methane to, to fire uh, energy, satisfy our energy need in the society. With a lot of methane bubble out, all those are global warming gas, and more infrared will be trapped. And that, when that happened, last year happened, temperature suddenly will go up. It's not like 1.5, 2 degrees, where suddenly it goes up. So it's interesting, in the year 2000, a Japanese scientist called Nishizawa Jun Ichiro, he was the quantum physicist. Then he became the president of the university. He wrote a book with his friend, and he said, humanity will disappear in 80 years. <laughs> that was in the year 2000. He said, humanity will disappear in 80 years. The way he based this conclusion was because, as I said, when temperature go up to a certain degree, many things frozen in the lake or in the ocean will bubble out, and the temperature suddenly go up, and humanity will disappear. And when he published a book in the year 2000, not too many people take, take it seriously. But everything he said did have scientific base in what happening now is exactly follow what he predicted. And this is what I said. Yeah, that professor, Nishizawa Junichiro, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite remarkable. Every time he, when he discussed with me about global warming, he always take a globe and take an entire globe to look at what is happening rather than look at Japan and see what Japan is happening. He has a global view, but nobody like him in Japan <laughs> because he always says something uh, against their so-called common nonsense. Not common sense. <laughs> well, so, you know, if you don't make you know, s strong claims. Yeah. People don't pay attention, so he needs to make those strong claims. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> also, my wife said, you have to say it in smiling ways. <laughs> People <laughs> will misunderstand. <laughs> So his Holiness is wondering if it's true that in 80 years nobody will be left. He's wondering whether this is the kind of thing we should be doing now. <laughs> well, uh, that was one of the reasons during the last two decades I spent most of my time on these issues and I also run for the president, say, of International Council for Science. And because of this issue, uh, as a scientist, I do feel some responsibility to, to deal with it. Now, the dilemma is the following. No matter you where you are, 
especially in the developing country, you do see the one who are still in the wheel said, full speed ahead. We're talking about economic development. He said the free trade and globalization machine. In Taiwan, we have the similar problem. Industry, one of our president or prime minister to solve five things. He said, in order to develop, we need more energy, more water, more cheap labor, more talent, and more land. So they ask five things. On the other hand, say, no, we have too many uh, greenhouse, too much greenhouse gases. Air is too dirty. It produces a lot of junk. So this machine should not just move on like this. We have to change. We have to reduce the pollution, reduce the greenhouse gases. Economy need to develop the transformation of economy and transformation of energy usage should take all those into account. Otherwise, humanity would not survive. Um, that is the, the current uh, awkward situation. So, many months ago, many of our friends said, don't build a coal-fired power plant. Our government planned to build a coal-fired power plant in the northeastern part of Taiwan. So don't do it. We have to save the energy, transform the society. But we're happy. When we are on, on our way here, our prime minister said, okay, we have stop building the coal fire power plant. So we, we are really in, in this stage of negotiating environment for the future of humanity. What should be responsible? for the next generation. For the next generation, they are in this situation. Somebody sitting behind said, do something. You bunch of maniac. It means, maybe including me, <laughs> bunch of maniac. You own the economic growth boat, and the boat will go down. Boat will go down. At least we stop the water flow or turn the ship around. But many people in front, uh, elderly people, will say, well, it's easy to just criticize young lady. And someone said, and assume you've got alternative or walk out, have you? The other one said, hysterical maniac, historical ego fan fanatics. Or is telling people how to do, how to live. I say, get yourself a proper job. <laughs> but that's the reality we are facing. How much time we have before the boat goes down? No much. This IPPC report said 10 years. We really have to. to to make a great change in two, 10 years. Oh. And so if I make a quick summary, I said, politically speaking, this is a global problem in need of global solutions. As I said, that we look at Earth, there's not really national boundary. Earth is one. It's a global problem. We need to have global solutions. But now, United Nations want every country to reduce the carbon dioxide and said by 2050, we have to reach zero emission. We're always talking about every country, every country. But rich country might be able to do it. Poor country will have a very hard time. And if something happened, the one who suffer will be the poorest country, suffer first. The other thing is, socially, we mu must turn away from the path of the overdeveloped societies. When United Nations says sustainable development goal, 20 years ago in Rio meeting, Rio Janeiro meeting, 
<coughs> the Prime Minister of Norway is an excellent scientific uh, political leader. She defined sustainable development is the development which satisfies the need of the current generation and do not compromise the need of the next generation. And she, she says so. So everybody said that's a reasonable thing. Sustainable development is to satisfy our need and will not compromise the need of the next generation. But I disagree. I told her, what is the need? What, what do you mean by need? Do we need 10 kilowatt like if American live? Or you live, you need 100 watt like some of the very poor people in Mumbai with one piece of clothes, smiling happily. They don't know anything, not have anything, just try to eat. If one human being, <laughs> if one human being just sleep and do not do anything, 100 watt will keep him alive. That might be the need for survival. For in America, 10 kilowatt. And so when you said to satisfy the need of our generation, Two kilowatt enough? Yeah. So whenever I went to the international meeting for the sustainable development, the from the rich country, people would not compromise the so-called high living standard, keep on improving. So this is called need. But the need of the poor people in the poor country are different. So this is the one thing we really have to look at very seriously. Socially, we must turn away from the past of the overdeveloped society. Many of the society has overdeveloped. Overdeveloped. What is interesting, when I was in Sri Lanka, a large fraction of Sri Lankan are Buddhists. They can't accept that we should live simply. And that idea, a Buddhist can accept. But all of the people in Europe and keep on saying the economy will keep on grow, the developing, energy requirement will go up, so we only want to use science to solve the problem. But I do believe socially we must turn away from the past of the overdeveloped society. Every society has to develop a different way. And technologically speaking, uh, Mr. Lin, who left, uh, he talked about how efficiently we can harvest the sunshine. Ten years ago, scientists predicted within 10 years, electricity generated by photovoltaic will be cheaper than electricity produced by burning the fossil fuel. And that goal has really been achieved. Now, the only thing is we do not know how to store those energy, electricity. So that need to, to do more. We might learn to split water directly into hydrogen and go into hydrogen society or use electricity to store in the more efficient battery or transform some chemicals. So that's something we really need to learn. So, we are now living in, in this earth. And this earth, it's not healthy. It got cold. Keep on coughing. We have to fix it. Otherwise, we know the sun will be burning human society might not survive. So everybody said, how can I go to maintain sustainability? So I simply said that the 
pathway to global sustainability. This is a global response to global problem. Everybody has to work together. Now, every year, there are 2.5 percent of GDP was spent on the weapon. As a, yeah, your holiness talked about yesterday, There's so many weapons and making and killing each other. Well, those in, uh, those money, 2.3 percent, are used for sustainable development, for the social transformation, for technological transformation. We can solve the problem, but we are not doing that. The second thing is. We have to go back to nature, go back to sunshine. Don't believe that the men are the master of the nature and keep forgetting that there are lots of energy coming from sunshine. We can use it rather than let sunshine heat up the house and keep on turning on the air conditioner and burn more energy. But the third thing, we learn to live better for less. And this is the something I cannot convince the Western people, yeah, to live better for less. And third thing is control population explosion. That is happening to some more industrialized society, but at the same time, our average longevity is increasing and part of the population explosion is people are getting older, society are getting older. So that's something we really need to, to tackle. Maybe from the political, uh, religious uh, point of view, doctors try to cure diseases. The well said, we are pro-life. We want to eliminate cancer, we want to eliminate this disease, and life will become longer and longer. You replace the kidney, replace the heart, replace anything. And is that what we want to do? <coughs> <coughs> okay, excuse me. So, when we said control population explosion, I, I don't like people trying to tell me, say, Professor, you should do this, you should do that, then you will live 120 years old. I said, no. At the proper time, we just say goodbye. And, <laughs> and also, the, the other important thing is improve equal equality around the world. What is really horrible in the past it's like the UN has a Millennium Development Goal and said we pull the people out of poverty, out of starvation. But this discrepancy between rich and poor is expanding and society is moving toward the rich people's uh, uh, favor. So although people are out of poverty, they are not happier. So the Equality is really very important. And I did say that uh, we should live a simpler life. We might have a society, we don't need a car. In the last meeting, in the international meeting, people are excited that now technology has come to a point we can have a car without driver. Car will drive itself. So that will move into a so-called sharing economy. One does not have to own a car, but car shared by many people. You just type in your location where you want to go. A car will come automatically or take you there. Then there will be more car. So there will be opportunity to make more business. I said, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. That's not the development of humankind. I do believe and agree with some other group of people. When people came from Netherlands, they said, well, recently, we a village are developing, and village people come to Amsterdam by train, then they start to ride bicycle or walk. So Amsterdam is a 
old city, road, and railroad. So automobile is really not a wonderful place. But I was really impressed and amazed by the driver in Nalandasa. We are really better than quantum, quantum scientists. So we did make the judgment. But what I'm saying is, if we move into a society such that our society is have a car-free man. It's a man to not have a car. Just like this, we have a public transportation. Or you go to a society with man-free car. Car without man. Which is more advanced? I'm not sure we really want to go to a place with a car running, so many cars running around. And we also know that they, you don't need a big house if you make the most of the smaller space and enjoy tiny energy bills. And also we can live in a clean place. Not really highly energy consuming way of living life. But I have been talking too long except I want to show one of the picture of um, late Professor Sherry Loran. He was my very good friend. We worked together for quite a long time um, in many international scientific meetings. He was older. He worked on the ozone hole program mm -hmm. you mentioned, and he made a important contributions. He said, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make prediction if in the end all we are willing to do is to stand around and wait for them to come true. So he did take action. In the seventies when ozone hole program he understood the seriousness and how to cure it. He appeared in many gatherings in political organization and came to see Montreal Protocol to come to realization and he made great contribution. So he did a great job. I admire him very much. Otherwise, as he said, science developed well enough to make predictions. If at the end all we are we need to do is to stand around and say, Yes, global warming has come to a point we are all going to disappear. I was joking yesterday, like watch, I watched the bill so much, the monitor, or oh, you slept five hours last night and a deep sleep on the one and a half hours tell you everything. Maybe one day they'll tell me, Professor Lee, you are dead. <laughs> <laughs> So, today I'd like to discuss with you and that global warming issue is really very serious and we really need to tackle it in earnest. It's wonderful. So I think I... Global uh, warming is a very, very serious matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so due to that, more and more nature disaster come. Everything, as or yesterday also is mentioned, everything interdependent. Interconnected along. So we have to uh, take care about the environment. And for that, our lifestyle also is have to think seriously. Mm -hmm. And development itself is we have to think, use more solar system or air solar wind. Energy, right? Solar energy, Pure. And, yeah. Air. Uh, wind energy. Oh. So solar energy, that's why I said, it's huge, it's huge. Yeah. So, 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 so,
So, so with respect to solar energy, yes. um, harvesting seems to be kind of taking on. So more and more people are using it. So for example, right next to the Delhi airport, there's a solar energy yes. field. Yeah. Hmm? Then, I think yesterday, or day before yesterday, one news in Delhi, uh, they concerned sort of officials, so they are thinking private car mortgage. So they think of, in fact, uh, gradually phasing off the ownership of private cars mm -hmm. in because, Delhi. Because of too much pollution. No? So people, you see, uh, now the big company, big nation, uh, I really, uh, with respect, I really feel sad The America withdraw from Paris Accord, yeah. Yeah. Accord. These are, it's quite sad. So, so now important is the scientist, now, Kasota, the consequences of this immediately, the educational success shared on your day. So it seems to be important now for the scientists to really up their voice yeah. and really bring it into the whole education of the public yes. about the predictions and really the danger that is mm -hmm. facing us. And then uh, you also touch the poor, rich and poor. Yes. Oh. Very serious matter. The best thing, out of sense of compassion, you see, try to promote the poor people's living standard, their economic condition, and the richer people, more practice of content. Contentment. Love. Or contentment. So, last two days, we very much sort of also discuss about external thing. Now, ultimately, you see, real change, machine cannot do. Real change is human, a human heart. So, now we have to think the how to uh, improve our thinking, the self-centered attitude, it's very harmful. Ultimately, uh, individuals themselves also suffer. We are part of the humanity. Global warming, these things, these individual people also suffer. So we have to think the global or say the uh, issue, these things. So I feel that ultimately, you see, through education, change human sort of way of thinking. So that's, I feel, very important. Now, scientists, you see, uh, shows on very, because very detailed data. data. Wonderful. But ultimately, the human being's mind uh, change, not through law, but through education, knowledge. So in that part, the scientists, I think very important, yeah. make it clear, that's important. This is not just academic thing, but related with the society, related with the whole world. So, if you see not as it is sufficient change our mind. And then we need another revolution. <laughs> Socialist revolution. <Yes. laughs> if that kind of revolution come, I will join. Yeah. <laughs> With the monk's rope. Uh, oh. Okay. Very good. Very good. <laughs> I think in a sense, scientists are waiting. We science. already said scientists global warming, one and a half degree, hmm? two degree. Yes. But since 
the temperature in the summer and winter change more than 30, 40 degrees. So one or two degree uh, doesn't hit them. He said, oh, if you are warm, just turn on the air conditioner. Two degrees doesn't mean anything for them. So I think we have to do something, a better job to explain the change in the world, changing climate. <laughs> Maybe I already mentioned the uh, at a meeting, Nobel laureate meeting, about uh, free nuclear weapon. Or I mentioned we should set up one timetable. Then uh, worldwide movement. So similarly, mm -hmm. environment, these things. Uh, I'm hoping. I already sort of mentioned the Indian nuclear, nuclear market, the Nobel laureate. Kasa mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the head of the, the international uh, planet, um, um, international. Pachori. Yeah. Pachori. 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 And anyway, I can't remember his name, but I know, you see, he, I know him. And uh, recently, one occasion I met, we met. Mm. Then I suggested, as a Nobel laureate, you should sort of organize one Nobel laureate's meeting. Peace, uh, also. Peace laureate. Uh, yeah. Peace laureate. Mm. And then also you see, should, uh, about environment, I think, mm. uh, one particular sort of topic, of the topic the focus. environment. Yeah. And then uh, should invite some scientist. And is make clear the negative consequences if present sort of way of life continuously go. Yeah. So this, I think, change through uh, through force difficult, but through understanding. So through education, it is possible. So therefore, I think that like uh, Nobel laureate meeting, and then. Some the uh, uh, scientists, uh, international scientists, sort of meeting yep. somewhere and discuss. And I think uh, with scientists, maybe it's good to the Nazucha A, B, C, D, So one thing that would be really helpful is you know something that the scientists can collectively produce on what we can do you know, A, B, C, and so on. So there are practical proposals that people can do. Not only just idea, you see, sh must show the way. Uh, then I think some, uh, some effect, I think, come. So, so this year, 2018, is really a very unusual year. Because everything mm. was predicted happening, and temperature hit the highest, and lots of calamity took place. So this year has waken up lots of people. And as I said, we don't have much time left, but we still have time. And so we should not give up. 80 years, Lamna, Ms. Yichi Marta. But um, the prediction of 80 years' end of humanity might be. A little hard to take <laughs> for people. <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're going to stop for tea, a tea break for 10 yeah. minutes. Okay. Yes. Good. <laughs> we'll break for 10 minutes, not more than 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been asked by the organizers to moderate this second half of our morning session. Um, so first, I would like to thank Professor Lee for your, you know, very powerful presentation and reminding all of us, you know, what we are facing. 
and the you know, responsibilities this knowledge places on all of us. Mm. So what I would like to do is to actually, I would like to open the, field, you know, the floor to all the participants. But before I do that, uh, with your holiness's permission, I would like to acknowledge two very special guests that Office of His Holiness had invited to this you know, conference uh, as observers. So these are the leaders of two Mind and Life organizations. So can I invite Professor Susan Bauer to stand up? She is the president of Mind and Life Institute based in the United States. And Ms. Amy Varela, can you stand up? She is the chair of Mind and Life Europe. And these two Mind and Life organizations have been uh, really a main vehicle that has initiated and, you know, um, um, developed further and also continue to facilitate important conversations between investigative traditions coming from the Buddhist and contemplative traditions and contemporary science. So I just wanted to acknowledge <coughs> their presence here. Um, so what I would like to do is to invite the presenters now um, to take this opportunity to have as much as possible kind of a conversation as we have now listened to everybody's presentation. So there's a kind of a integrated view or understanding emerging in our brain now. So you can take this opportunity, each of you, to either pose a question to your colleague or to our two senior statesmen here, Professor Lee and His Holiness, or you, want, you can take the opportunity to you know, add further where you thought the, in, you did not have enough time and you would like to clarify certain points or elucidate certain points that you made presentations. You, I will leave that to you. So um, there are two microphones on the table. So if you can, anyone, um, I would like to now invite you. The floor is open, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Maybe I can see Yeah, it's, I think it's, yeah, it's on. Yeah, okay, it will be a great uh, opportunity for me. Your Holiness, I really like to uh, know your view from you your personal experience and then also the religious. As my question of uh, yesterday, in my presentation, the last page, what? Because you're talking about this, we have this empty space, but then I have to put in something randomly. That's what we see in the material we study. When you have a very old empty space and then put in randomly the species of interest, then we get something interesting coming out. Just like uh, Professor Lee said, we are building, looking for just the space, the room, and then change it and something coming out. So what's your view, yeah, from your personal view, of this kind of uh, picture? Chakshe <laughs> So the in fact um, when we talk about empty space Again, you have to think in terms of the scale and the framework. So like in this room, we have spaces to move around, so it's an empty space. But then if you probe further, there's a lot of particles still moving in this empty space. So it's not absolutely empty. So empty is con the idea of empty space seems to be you know, adjusted to the framework that we are talking. <laughs> So, so if we're talking at the level of the at atomic level, then you know each atom is going to occupy a space. So it's it's not going to allow another atom to take its place. So there is a kind of a, a spatial occupation. 
occupation of a space. Chazanga, Bana, do you turn up your devil? Do you turn up the mating egg, Tongsha Menaya, Yunguchetor? Chazma, Candislaw. Da the Rabba, Rabba Jig, the Conca against Mena, and do you turn up with a candy or day? Could you? So the 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 idea of how empty space plays a role in this physical interaction seems to be a complicated one. So if you look at the the atomic level, um, you know. It is conceivable that the you know the, the particles may knock on each other, but that still does not preclude the possibility of hem, them these particles having the space to move around to express their you know existence. So this the role space plays seems to really differ. Okay. <laughs> あんたがずっと白の根付きちゃんじゃしてるわ。だ。わ。だし、こんなもん白の根付きてるわ。だ。さだ。あと、何気。で、ロスやってこうと。くどるしてとなさんちゃんす。ま、ちんじゅかにや
or single-pointed mind, and then mind, you see, not attracted, not follow the sensorial sort of experience, just mind. Oh. So he can remain there three, four, three hours. Then when, you see, he fully concentrate about three hours, and some deeper experience also now oh, arise. Oh, yeah. arise. So these are something living thing, something true, and not just the lo tong da ji kong ji ji chung ri tu jin ji chung zai di xiao ma re an da ran an zai de. So we don't need to invoke the you know stories about great masters of the past that may have lived a thousand years or a hundred years ago, but these are phenomena of our time. So, uh, and also I think I already mentioned Richard de Wissing at the. So His Holiness already mentioned the, the American scientist who has initiated a project to study the Tukdam phenomenon, which is the, the phenomena of a person remaining in a state that is beyond clinical death but with the body fresh. So, and then some people remember past life. New York, the Kamachu was using you to talk about that. Cosa Twin Tower. Twin Tower. Twin Tower. Twin Tower. No. Genoa, to do she should be Michi, or Puguchi, to do Kadaka. She was yourself shared to Sula. So recently, Solon has heard of a case in America where there was a child who can recall quite vividly the experience of you know, dying. In the you know um, the, the September 11 attack and the destruction of the twin towers. Mm. Among Tibetan also you see there, uh, and some I among Indian also. Now later, I I think uh, I did not sort of the contact, but otherwise, uh, one occasion I met one girl, I think. Six six year old from Bodhiyala. Uh, that girl very clearly remember about past life. Uh, so on. There are, I myself, you see, met, you see, uh, some children who have clearly remember, remember about past life. So, my own case, I think when I was very young, you see, seems to see there are some memory about past life that my mother told me. Mm. Then getting because older, older, all this memory gone. That also we can say the very young age, two year, three year, four year, five year, the, the new brain not yet fully developed. At that time, the Vague memory about past life still can, can be more active. active uh, then this new body, new brain, you see, further develop. Then these sort of memory eventually disappear. So recently, I, I met one of the students in the city. Changing so there was a recently a case of a young Tibetan boy who was... So there was a case of a young Tibetan boy who was... So there was a case of a young Tibetan boy who was... So there was a case of a young Tibetan boy who so there's a case of a young boy who was uh, recognized as the reincarnation of a, 
a, a senior Tibetan teacher at one of the monasteries in Ganden, and uh, from was born in Tibet. And actually, as a child, said that I need to go back to my monastery. So when they took him to the monastery Ganden in in Tibet, he said, "Not this one." So the one in India. So they brought him, and as they reached the outskirt of the monastery, the boy was able to point which part of the monastery, you know, that where he's from, and also went to the room uh, of the the past master, and took out, opened one of the drawers, and said, "That's those are my glasses, reading glasses." Did you look at you now, Dandy? About four or five, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, so his holiness was saying that recently he met um, the now his young man. So his holiness asked him, "Do you still have faint memories of your past life?" He said, "No." So I said, "Well, welcome and join me." Some my friend meditator. When they meditate, uh, the single-pointed way about the mind, uh, sixth mind, then uh, gradually the grosser level of mind Thoughts. become no. ka. Thoughts. Thoughts. They, they dissolve. Yeah. More because of the weak. Then the the some sort of memory about past life. Then some sometimes you see appear. One of my hundred get topuchu new money trying to do it. Chubber chubber it. Cosa, think could you be a much your cosa? Ka Ka Columbus Marwas. Ka だ、だ、だ、ごちゃ Chungu or Chungu Ruchigi Gallare Yoja Kurkutu, Shoja Ninja Tram Jigi Lomare Menizam Jaziri, Gale Betal, Chigin Yakos in the Chigri, or Tinsa, Kumchi, Maran, to be such a to com. D. Com Kemni, and to do Chigi Lame. Good so his holiness, one of his friends, a colleague, um, uh, a Kagyu master, I don't know. Um, um, so one of his colleagues, uh, a close friend, a Kagyu master, uh, shared with him that, um, you know, once in his, this person's meditation, he was able to go very deep into a meditative state inspired by the recollection of the kindness of his guru. And that led to a very devotional experience in his mind, which then allowed the mind, the everyday mind, to really kind of, you know, still and quieten it. And then after that, when he was able to remain single-pointed on this, it's as if the grosser thought processes come to kind of, you know, quieten and remain still. Then there were moments he could actually have, you know, some some memory kind of, you know, glimpses coming from his past life. So he actually shared that experience directly with his holiness. Yeah. He very honest. So I don't think he has all that. He would tell, tell a lie. lie. Yeah. Otherwise, some lamas, there's danger to telling lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
挤多多的时间，一个多月。是。The the cover there, is it on? Can you? Yeah. Uh, your holiness, I have three questions. One from me, and two from friend and Miss Lai. Uh, the first question is that uh, uh, this few days we talk about uh, a lot on this uh, superposition principle. So I was curious that uh, when you do meditation, I mean analytical meditation, does this um, quantum physics viewpoint help you to do, I mean, yeah. mechanism meditation? And the second question is that uh, uh, this meeting, I mean, uh, do you think the, uh, the meeting reached the original goal you expect? Uh, the, second, the third question is that uh, after the meeting, do you have any suggestion to, or I mean, expectation for our this, uh, Chinese uh, scientist community? That's my question. Oh, my daily sort of practice is meditate on shunyata, kung shin, kung shin, kung shin. Oh. Emptiness, yeah. Oh, there's... Uh, very important part of my meditation. And then altruism. Actually, do so, <laughs> so the, the, the heart of my daily meditation practice really is consists of two main um, and the themes. One is the cultivation and deepening of my insight into the teaching on emptiness, the shunyata. Uh, the other one is the cultivation and, and the further development of altruism, the bodhicitta, which is the aspiration to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings, uh, grounded in a universal compassion. So those are really the two main you know, focus. So with respect to emptiness, um, there is an important um, um, passage in Tsongkhapa's um, um, three, a t short text called Three Principal Elements of the Path, where Tsongkhapa talks about how, um, you know, when you reach a point where without, you know, interruption, if you are able to r recognize the essential empty nature of whatever you are observing with a simple awareness of their dependently originated nature. So in other words, the mere perception of the phenomena as a dependent phenomena, dependent you know, uh, thing, originate, dependently originated thing, immediately give rise to the awareness of their essential empty character. So at that point, the analysis, the path of analysis, the journey of analysis has reached its culmination. So his Holiness was saying that he feels he's getting there, so getting close to it. So I didn't do Shan Nave Yota Sister, the Grandulta, Kandata Tarangi, Gurta Tarajan, the Kajanguzi Tarayu, but that's the Jedi. She was in the Kajan Russia. So any big Nungdu Nine Ko. She Tugo 
Doctor so so uh, earlier, I forgot to um, point out one fact that His Holiness was citing from Tsongkhapa's text, which involves uh, the idea that y when you reach the culmination of your inquiry, then all basis for objectification comes to an end. Because we have a tendency generally to grasp at things, to seek something that is congruous, something that is out there. But when you reach the culmination of your inquiry through the logic of emptiness, there will be no basis left at all for objectification. So um, now all of this, um, then Tsongkhapa goes on to say that when you have that kind of understanding of the world, then the very world of appearance will remind you of their essential empty nature. Because in our naive, realistic view of the world, we tend to believe in the apparent world. We tend to go after the appearance. But through this kind of you know, analytic thinking, but you come... Of his finger, okay. it? So then you immediately recognize that there is a... So you, you know, normally we chase after the appearance. We, we believe in our perception. But with this kind of logic, you immediately, the moment you perceive phenomena, you immediately are aware that there is a disparity between our perception and reality. So you don't believe in the appearance. So in this way, the appearance itself reminds you of their essential empty nature. So that the appearance and reality really come to be united. So there is you know, no, no gap. And the, the, the power of that is then it will really help you sort of, you know, um, undercut the whole psychological process that normally give rise to our negative reaction to phenomena. Because generally, if you examine when we relate to the world, we, because of the fixation on some kind of objective or reality out there, we tend to grasp, and this grasping then give rise to false projection, you know, false kind of, you know, conceptualization. And this false conceptualization involves attributions of you know, quality on the phenomena, which then give rise to our reaction based on either attraction or repulsion, manifesting in the form of attachment or aversion, and then it opens up the whole <coughs> chain. So whereas if you do this, you know, process of thinking through emptiness, you remove the basis for any false projection and false conceptualization, which then you know, leave, you know, leaves no basis for the strong emotional reactions to arise. So that really seems to be, so in this context, at least with relation to the physical things, quantum thinking will really help. Because quantum will, you know, uh, mechanics picture of the world will show that the world, the physical world is more complex than we tend to naively assume. Mm -hmm. So therefore less basis for grasping. So in this area, as some scientists point out, there is a possibility that it can lessen your tendency to grasp. So, and it, it will be really helpful. So now what you need to do is to, you need to combine that with, uh, you know, bodhicitta practice, which you, so, so generally what happens is that a lot of our problem really comes from strong clinging to a notion of self, I, I, I. And there seems to be two ways in which you can undermine this, knock at it. One way, one side, one approach is the emptiness approach that we just spoke about. The other approach is really to look at, you know, how self-centeredness leads to all sorts of problems. 
and how we open up our view and perceive, perceive others in a different way. So this is all the teachings that we find in Shantideva's uh, Bodhicharya Avatara. And if you sort of that involve meditations of exchanging and equalizing self and others, so if you combine the the, the emptiness, you know, practice with the practice of you know exchange of self and others, which is an altruism practice coming from Shantideva's text, then you really have a powerful practice. So, therefore, you know, in his own uh, daily, uh, you know, everyday practice, one of the most um, powerful sources of inspiration is the following uh, passage from Shantideva's text, where Shantideva makes the aspiration that as long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too remain to help mis, you know, re- relieve the, dispel the sufferings of the world. So with, you know, this, this particular verse you know, has a tremendous power of inspiration. So therefore, even though if the scientists are right and the world is going to, you know, the humanity is going to disappear from this particular planet in 80 years, but there are other universe systems and my hope is that I'll be in those universe systems still serving the needs of other sentient <laughs> beings. <laughs> Yeah, Gangatisubishengi. Catch Jung <laughs> So um, this reminds His Holiness of um, one of his, um, you know, attendants at a very early age who was assisting him in his studies, in the philosophical studies, and a particular person by the name of Ngudup Sonyi Tenshab. He was uh, really, uh, you know, the most important person at the time with respect to, you know, awakening interest. Um, Inner Mongolia, his native place is Abak, in part of Inner Mongolia. So he top was scholar, top scholar. So he was the person who really made a huge difference in awakening in His Holiness, a, a deep, in, you know, interest in Nagarjuna's philosophy of emptiness. So this, you know, uh, Geshe a scholar used to say he would cite a passage from Tsongkhapa. <laughs> There is a, a praise to the Buddha for teaching dependent origination. <laughs> the passage says that um, um, 
the the statement that you know because of dependent origination uh, one will not fall into any extremes and this this is the truth that you have taught and that is the best way of you know praising the buddha so that is the passage so i'm just paraphrasing the translation so and Ngurup Sonyi would cite the, that uh, uh, passage and tell His Holiness when he was young, saying that the first two lines, you know, it's a tough one. I still can't get it. So His Holiness was saying that, um, you know, <laughs> so over a period of 60, 70 years he, since he began taking serious interest in Nagarjuna's uh, teachings, uh, philosophy, and now, you know, when he remembers that statement and looks at that particular passage, he could, <laughs> he could boast and say, that doesn't seem to be that hard now. <laughs> so, Very good. So I'm the second question. Oh. And third, yeah. Not like the uh, the importance of environment, as you, Kasoda, explained this morning very detail, and then also the other, other uh, speakers. Now these are, I think, it's very important. You see, some kind of warning, not a political reason, or uh, but the as a result of study, investigation, uh, uh, give some kind of warning. Very good, very useful. Now one thing, uh, not very clear, that is, is a quantum, the person who truly believes, you see, nothing exists as appears. You see, that uh, some sort of the impact. Of impact in our the so one thing that um, from His Holiness's point of view we would like to see further kind of uh, discussed is the impact one's understanding of the quantum physics might have on one's perception of reality and its implications for one's you know, tendency to look at things in black and white ter terms, you know, sort of the our tendency to be absolute in relation to things. Mm -hmm. uh, so that part reserved for future discussion. And then, as I already mentioned, you see, the scientists from the West are oh, wonderful. Really wonderful. Uh, but then, you see, their whole culture is very much related with the concept of God, creator. Uh, uh, in Asia, uh, not that. See, something, uh, some sort of Indian tradition clearly mentioned self creation. <coughs> you see, no, no creator. So, therefore, all the responsibility is on your own shoulder. So training of mind becomes very important. Mm -hmm. It is not sufficient just to pray, pray. As a Buddhist, pray to Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. Mm -hmm. Buddha himself, mm -hmm. So Buddha himself made the following statement that the Buddhas don't... Uh wash away the negative karma of sentient beings, nor can he transplant his own realization in others. It's only by showing the truth that he himself has found to others, he can lead them to freedom. And then it, Buddha also made the statement that you are, you, know, you are your own master, you are your own savior. So training of your own mind hmm. is the key thing. So many Tibetan and some Chinese also you see, Amitop, Amitop, Amitop. All responsibility put on. Because Amitop, Amitop, Amitop. 
Vedi Tibet'in olsu işi. Kuncu çeyin, kuncu çeyin, sem çoğunda şaya keşke mevcut. Kuncu rangı için nangı yiyip soruşu. Kuncu çeyin sabici. So same thing with Tibetans. You know, they you know often give the impression that they place all their trust in the three jewels as if they don't have to do any work themselves. <laughs> uh, that. So this, I, I feel, is more easier to discuss with Asian scientists. You see, mm. your mind in deeper level, not fixed, or oh, creator, absolute. I think yesterday I mentioned the father of Wayne called Lusung. Oh. One, my great friend, Catholic monk, Father Wayne, now no longer passed away. So, and many, uh, many occasions we discuss about, you see, how to develop compassion and also understanding impermanence, these things is common. So we discuss. Uh, then one day he asked me, about the emptiness, kungxing. Then I respond, don't ask that, that is not your business. Mm -hmm. oh, because, you see, according to kungxing, uh, kungxing, nothing independent existence, that theory might hinder his single-pointed faith, creator, creator absolute. Oh. So, uh, I, so I stop, don't ask that, that's not your business, like that. So that is Asia, like it's not going to be. For Asians, this is not an issue. Quran, chicken dishes. And then also, uh, one, one time, I asked uh, Father Wayne, oh, if you accept previous life, oh, what is the problem? What is the, uh, theologically speaking, what no. is the problem? Then he said, no, we can't. Because this very life created by God. So you see, in a deeper level, you see certain uh, religious sort of concept, you see, uh, little differences. According to theistic religion, creator. The non-theistic, no creator. So it makes differences. Difference. Oh. So I really uh, very much enjoy talking or discuss with Asian scientists. Really, hmm? our talk even I think help you see to reduce the conviction. I'm a top. I'm a top. Deeper, eh? So then, that, that that's not a problem. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do have a question. Oh yes. When I was young, my mother asked me to kill the chicken for the New Year, so I have to give the prayer. So I'm sorry that you are going to die, but <laughs> hopefully, next generation you are born. Oh in a rich family and we we'll have a better <laughs> Osre, life. Osre. So I have to repeat this and every time I, because my, my mother didn't want to kill any chicken, <laughs> so I have to Ninja. do it. But my question is the following. Oh. You believe with the previous life, previous life and the next life, is that important for humanity to survive on the surface of Earth? If Thousand years later, a monkey take over, or other species take over. Would that concern you, or is that important for humanity, human being, to continue to? Oh, these are no. I think we are not talking just this world, this planet. Mm -hmm. So multiple world systems, according to Buddhist yeah. cosmology, mm -hmm. and in fact, talks about countless world systems. Yeah. Uh, 
그러게 다저 제모 밀루토야 또 카우 제명에 기고 가야 돼 마루 마루 있는데 근데 진짜 제가 좀 봐. So this reminds his holiness of uh, uh, a senior monk from the Nam- Namgyal monastery. He was the ritual assistant and um, you know as he was beginning to hear more about the modern reality and the contraception issues and so on. So one day shared with his holiness he was a little concerned it says he was saying that it looks like the chances for being reborn as a human is getting less and less because people are using contraception <laughs> <laughs> so his holiness was saying that his thinking was just too narrow there are other world mm-hmm. systems oh zamulundi yozo tong sasu ne de garso shinda yeoro so even if our current you know present universe come to an end there would be other, there will be other world systems yeah. 그래서 똥니 주루 시베 망치 가야 토마토 한번 치 가서 침부통군이야. 가. 침부통군이 가서 토마토 타고 매들. 토마토 매들 나래. 어? 제사가 드디 인도산에 다지 어 심지 세베 타 가고 싸래. 심지 제장 어찌 타이 어 개회 타이 용토우리. 다 심지 지용 시베 있나? 천다 장미랑 뭐 장미랑 어제 얼마. 다지 장미랑 뭐 가서 주부를 사우나. So in the from the Buddhist point of view, uh, actually, um, you know, not only is the universe systems understood to be countless, um, also sentient beings are is understood to be countless. So we can speak of a beginning of a life, an end of a life, of yeah. a specific, you know, life cycle, but one cannot speak of. the beginning and the mm. end mm. so it's a sort of a countless systems mm. um so um then the kana and the karsa the so there's no yeah. so there's no so there's no beginning, so there no beginning when it comes to universe mm. and there's no end mm. one can talk about a specific universe beginning and end so and what the new nibe ko do ji me ve kum nibe na lo ya tong me is ko la la re ba 동원탐 poor people in the younger generation. Sorry. But in the long run, on the other hand, you talk about humanity will disappear. And lots of people say, who cares? Ganaso disappears. Humanity might disappear also. So God, are, God will take care. <laughs> 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 so there's some discontinuity in between uh, protecting the next generation and then What happened to the foreign generation? Yes, the people who are living in the world are living in the world. They 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 are living in the world. is that they have the mind mind with mind feeling there so joyful feeling and unhappy feeling there that's the really move whole evolution take place because of that so around so yeah so for survival oh yeah those an evolution somewhere. so this is how you know evolution of life mm. is driven mm. so therefore the uh every sentient being you see loves or take or loves their own life love to oneself oh. so therefore the insects they have uh, not much intelligence so they do not know their long term uh consequences but only human species this special brain so we have the ability to think century after century or millennia 
是吧 ？Million of million of millions million of millennium millennium like that. Oh, so then, uh, this is some of our way of life, and once because of the single-pointed, uh, short-sighted, just a material development development, uh, mm-hmm. and not much concern about consequences. So therefore, now uh, the like like you and those scientists I already mentioned, you see, make clear if present sort of situation goes continuously, or we will face some extra problem. Then now, poor people, richer uh, family. They have all facility, air condition, everything. Poor people very much depend on just nature. So the world temperature increasing, then、uh, these poor people suffer most. Richer family in any way they can manage. So the gap rich and poor. Not only morally wrong, but practically also source of problem. The majority are poor people.、Mm. So if the majority really face some problem, then a few handful, the billionaire or millionaire, they also suffer. So therefore,、uh, we need a sense of oneness. Of seven billion human being, and concern about seven billion human being. If we really, you see, take care about seven billion human being as human brothers and sisters, I think much problem, including ecology, these things can reduce. So, century old, we only, you see, think. Oneself and their family, their community, their nation, like that.、Mm-hmm. So these things,、uh, not creation of mission, but creation from here.、Yeah. So we have to talk more、yes. about here,、yes. <laughs> not external things. I agree. <laughs> I am also curious.、Uh, you smile at me, so I smile at you. And my wife will be happier when I go back home. <laughs> She said, "Well, now you can smile better <laughs> after you meet <laughs> you." Kamu kaya mana tu? Mata kamu kaya ya, tapi kata ya kat je gitu. Actually, one sort of story. Kau mungkin dah sah. 那么成立起，阿米这个成立起，可能就弄那个意思。啊，那波莱曼，波莱曼，对不对？波莱曼，呀，那是得土呢，可就开始打开始成了，弄起来那么吃啥？可是阿是这个，确实就是不清楚，可是是谁做啥 ？So this reminds me so much of a story of、um, one of the very senior scientists in America, is、um, expert on emotion by the name of Paul Ekman.、Mm-hmm. Um, so Paul had well, participated in one of the Mind and Life dialogues, and at that time, his you know he interacted with His Holiness, and he generally had a problem with anger,、um, you know, the regulation of his anger. But he said after that five-day interaction with His Holiness,、mm-hmm. you know, he went back and for about an entire month he did not lose temper.、Mm-hmm. So his wife was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> So you know you have really changed. <laughs> That's great. Did the music play all right? Miss Sim Pusu told us to give us in. Then I just did. Just ah, who is that? Did you hear? Just did. She not she has or she not she has or get mad with you? Then that is something good. So that's true because sometimes you know people tend to get so caught up in their own. Anxiety and stress,、mm-hmm. which is focused on a very narrow view of their, you know, life.、Uh, when you are able to participate in experience like this, where there is a genuine openness, a space is created,、mm-hmm. and when you get an experience、mm-hmm. where you don't, you let down your guards. You don't have to be hyper vigilant, 
and be stressed, that experience really opens up a possibility of experience. Mm -hmm. And all of this, His Holiness was saying that he would say really arises from a recognition of shared humanity. Mm. If you smile at a dog, the dog learn how to smile back at you. The kill part, the zubache benam, zubaten benam, kill one at two smile she to a tap she and ask it. Because game get a kill over the initial you would. So I don't think they are capable of smiling, but they will really wag their tail much better. <laughs> and then, then they lick, licking. And then they lick, they, they lick. Yeah. Very beautiful. Yeah. I think, the, except the mosquito, I don't know <laughs> whether they have the ability to show appreciation. So many times, I expressed this uh, one, one time, Oxford, when I talk in the front line, some professors, many professors there, and I asked them, which level of what brain. size? What size of brain? Yeah. Oh, which level? Is that? Not it. Oh, brain have the ability, uh, appreciation. So nobody answer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the reason is like a mosquito seems to see no ability to appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> Other animal, yes. If you show, as uh, affection, affection, they also respond. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think unless you have a question, yeah, you've been waiting there. Yeah, and um, as a researcher, and we, uh, we, if we, we want to conclude something, we always uh, need uh, to repeat our measurement using different uh, samples and even using different uh, tec uh, techniques. And finally, we can publish the work. But for this work to be recognized, uh, then it has to be repeated by uh, people, researchers in other countries. Okay, so um, and you, your examples about, um, say, past life, something is very interesting. But um, I just don't know how uh, to repeat this type of evidence in, so that we can make this a very rigorous statement. So can you comment on that? Chevache Chicago, uh, uh, 
So in the classical tradition, um, the the proofs for something like the um, you know pre-existence um, comes from many different you know angles. One of which is the larger picture of the evolution of the world systems that we spoke about yesterday. That how universe goes through a period of emptiness then formation, then for a long time it remains, and then dis destruction, then repeats the cycle again. So from the Buddhist point of view, all of these universe systems are connected with sentient beings who would later inhabit these universe systems. Then the question is, how do we understand the evolution of life or evolution, evolution of consciousness, which is the defining characteristic of sentient creature? Then you have... Um, two choices. One is to say, you know, go to the theistic route to say that everything is created by prior design, or go to the other route, which is to say it just comes spontaneously. There is no, there is no reason. And both of these possibilities are fraught with logical problems. So then the the conclusion is that one needs to at least account it on the basis of a causal principle. And then you look at what the causation is, and so it's it's a sort of a you know it's a it's a cumulative you know approach which really is seen as 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 a proof or evidence. So that the kiji kiji kita jigbe dani, ada ko juju yu juju ni ko kiji kiji jigi orba da. So that jule ya kasu mas lebsa re tinji jin da nyeling ju, so chingo bu ani. え、ngazu do sometimes uh So so now with respect to say the physical um body, um we know from you know so from the Buddhist point of view, the body that we have, if you trace its origin, you know, uh, even though this body was born in this life, but the physical composition, the element that composed the body, you can trace it all the way back to the beginning. So in the, in the, from the Buddhist cosmology point of view, it's the period of empty stage where there are space particles. So, so there is no beginning, even to the physical continuum of the body. Then when it comes to consciousness, now, and, and... At the time, is a whole universe, one particular universe, completely disappear. And the space particle there. So today's, uh, our bodies, body. so subtle level, continuation, already there. So similarly, with respect to consciousness, then yesterday we spoke about, as part of the causation, you have causes and conditions. Conditions are commonly shared causes are unique to the effects. 
So the uniqueness of a cause suggests there needs to be some commensurate relationship between the cause and an effect. And between matter and consciousness, there is no commensurate <coughs> relationship. So consciousness, the fundamental characteristic of consciousness is the subjective experience. You know, it's the subjectivity. It's not a, uh, um, it's not a phenomenon that has spatial extension or obstructive quality. It is really a pure experience in subjectivity. And that, if you trace its causal chain, you know, if you want to say, posit a beginning, then you although either you have to say it was created by a powerful mind like a god, or you have to say it just came from nowhere. So ex, you know, sort of origination from you know nothingness. So both of these are problem. So then, therefore, you you know take the other alternative, which is to say, even with respect to consciousness, its continuity is you know beginningless. <laughs> So generally, it's a sort of a logical thinking process. So, for example, like whether the world has a beginning or not, it's finite. All of this is really a matter of critical reflection and thinking. So I think uh, Asian tradition, mainly Indian tradition, I think they really sort of, sort of utilize fully about the human intelligence. Investigate, 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 not believe. Here, one Indian, traditionally our guru, our teacher, all our knowledge uh, we learned from India. Uh, now today, the Guruji's knowledge become limited. <laughs> the student of ancient Indian Guru, uh, including myself and many monks, over 10,000 monk students here in India, mm. uh, and also Tibet, I think uh, several thousand mm. uh, carry study these things. Uh, not just read once one, one book, not that way, you see. Over 20 years, rigorous study. So now today, uh, in a way, unfortunate, the your chela become uh, your student now. more knowledgeable. Mm? Mm. Guru, <laughs> not much knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I think on that note, we will probably close. And uh, I would like to invite our senior statement, Professor Lee, to make your you know, final thoughts that you can share with us. And then after that, I'll invite His Holiness to offer some concluding remarks. Well, the last three days has been a wonderful experience for all of us. As we know, scientists, Look at the evidence and try to do many things and see whether it's true or not. But as his Holy said, sometimes time continues. So you want to repeat the experiment, like improve, repeat the experiment that you are in the existence. You have to trace back time to set the initial condition. It's not there. You won't, you won't be able to prove that you are here. And I did. Uh, I uh, did open my mind quite a bit coming here, because um, when we talk about quantum effect, we take a matter. All the matter have wave natures, except when the particle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller then the wave nature start to show. So quantum mechanics is needed to describe the law of those motions. A heavier particle, wave nature is not imp important. So classical physics, is classical mechanics is su sufficient to do it. And of course, in the human body, it's a big classical thing. But every molecule is a quantum mechanical um, 
manipulated, operated. So that's quite an interesting transition. And I still have lots of questions about the mind because many of us are so-called absent-minded professor. The <laughs> mind is separated <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so the first day when your holiness asked me, do we believe in the, in the separation between brain and mind? I said, yes, I do. And sometime at home, I do the dishes. My wife cook, mm. I do dishes. Mm. And I start to wash the dish and I forgot what I was doing. I was washing 10 minutes, 20 minutes, still washing. <laughs> then my wife come in and said, absent-minded professor. <laughs> and, and so, uh, there's something in the mind. Uh, I do believe in what you said. Recently, they are twin, exact twin. They dress the similar way, and artificial intelligence could not distinguish two two twins. But mother come in and can tell immediately uh, who's who's Mary, who is Susan, or something. But scientific equipment could not do it. Take the picture, all the same. Mm. And there's some, some some something about the human interaction that is beyond which appear on the surface. And I once was in China going to Great Wall. Foreigner has to pay more. When I was working with my friend, I didn't say a word. He looked at me and said, You're a foreigner. <laughs> I said, Why? He said, those who are born here would not hang such a silly smile. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think what he said was right, but um, somehow um, a silly smile shows that the, it's not related to uh, the environment, Local, yeah. the situation. <laughs> So this time, we did learn a lot about Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist science and your time, your space, time-space concept and many other things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I really uh, think uh, this beginning last uh, several times uh, discussion, Buddhist science and modern science, uh, mainly uh, Westerner and few occasion Russians. Now the Chinese scientist, this is the first time. So I'm hoping. So now this is just the beginning. This will be we carry a uh, discussion among the Chinese brothers, sisters, among the Chinese scientists, I think, uh, continuously. You know, this reminds me, Karsa, they're not allowed to chung with me, Jigsaw and Karsa. Chunghua Dasho. Chunghua Dasho. One professor. Uh, we first met. In America, the Washington Karsa Chokoti, Brooks, Brookings Institution, Brookings institution, Brookings institution, which is some uh, professors from China also. So one professor from Tsinghua Dasho. And then when I, I was in Peking, I also visited Tsinghua Dasho. So uh, since then, you see, we become very close friends. So many occasions he come. So then, one occasion, you see, uh, we make some kind of hostage. Proposal. Pledge. Proposal. Yeah. Pledge. Pledge. Uh, pledge. You see, 
in the future in his university, Tsinghua, Dashou. Oh, they say they're going to meet some kind of scientific meeting or something. So at that time, he uh, going to send invitation to me, not Dalai Lama, not as a Dalai Lama, hmm. but scientist. <laughs> as a scientist. <laughs> oh, so we already, you see, that kind of sort of thinking already there. So, uh, but for the time being, you see, men in China, no freedom, difficult. So only thing is professors or scientists from Taiwan. So eventually, I think uh, uh, there is possibility this, this kind of meeting in Taiwan, yeah. discuss. Or, We'll see. Yeah. Oh. So, I, in any way, I think uh, now, I think because of the right time, we must exploit the knowledge about mind, about emotion, which mentioned in Buddhist tradition. Hmm. Really, I think worthwhile. Hmm. Uh, should not remain in the Buddhist text, hmm. and those Buddhist uh, monks, they only so, are a carry prayer, prayer, prayer. Chanting. Hmm. Kaza. Chanting. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, so now time come. Let them also more study. Hmm. Then we can ask them. Yes. Otherwise, they simply uh, carry chanting, no explanation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So... I think uh, we hear few individual person, but we belongs a nation uh, over because of the, over billion population, and Taiwanese also is a part of Han, the Hanso Hanso. Hmm. Oh. So in many places, many part of the world. Also, you say Han community there. So you are representing uh, over a billion sort of number of one human group. And traditionally, Buddhist. So like, like Tibetan, you see, you Indian are uh, guru of mm. both Hans and Tibetan. Truly. <laughs> You see, we are student mm. of the uh, Nalanda tradition. Mm. As I, the first day I mentioned the very name of Lunsu Pusa, familiar. Mm. So, uh, so there is real potential. Yes. Now here we are a few people, but we are representing billions of people. Okay. Yeah. And that, not academic, but world passing through some kind of crisis of emotion. That emotion will not go, go away by prayer, but training our mind. In order to train our mind, we should have fuller knowledge about the whole system of our emotion and mind. As an academic subject, not a religious subject. Okay. Thank you. So, we will certainly mm? welcome you mm. in Taiwan, and we will initiate the continual discussion in Taiwan sometime. Thank you. Now lunch, my bad.
包包，然后等一下全部交给你。一起做这啊，对，一起照相。